Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Jordan Matter as tonight's guest speaker. His work uh, has garnered a cult following online with over 300,000 Facebook fans and 37,000 Instagram followers. Jordan is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Dancers Among Us, a collection of photographs of dancers in everyday situations around the world, which was selected as a best book by Oprah Magazine, Barnes & Noble, NPR, and Amazon. Jordan has been featured on television's ABC World News with Diane Sawyer, The Today Show, the BBC and the Tyra Banks Show. Among other publications include, including uh, the Huffington Post, Dance Magazine, and Dance Spirit Magazine. Um, Jordan is currently working on two follow-up books, Dancers After Dark and Tiny Dancers Among Us, forthcoming by Workman Publishing in 2016 and 2017, respectively. He also has a show of photographs at the uh, 92nd Street Y for another month and a half? Yes. For another month and a half, which is currently on view. Um, so please help me uh, give Jordan a warm welcome to our lecture series. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do we need this? I don't know. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. All right. How many of you here are uh, photographers or want to be photographers? Most of you? OK, great. So we can talk about that. If anybody has any questions throughout, please just um, Ask me, I'd like to start off with a self-portrait. <laughs> now, you know the hardest thing about self-portrait is timing your jump with your iPhone. I'd love to look like that. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you what a day at my office looks like to start, and then we'll have a chat about how this all happened. Always a little nervous at first because you never know what to expect with Jordan. I may be flying through traffic or diving past a moving train. You never know what it's going to be. Tokyo! South America! So that was released on the day that the book was released, and it helped, I think, uh, generate sales. The, the way that this process worked is I would go around to various cities, and then photographers would contact me and ask if they could join me, and I'd say, just bring a, you know, a video camera and film it, and then we compiled that for that. I'm gonna, I have a lot to say, so I, will, I know I only have two hours, so I understand, <laughs> so I will rush through it. I'm going to start with the one quote that guides my entire life and definitely my photographic process. And I just love that, because what it talks about is taking chances before you know what the outcome is going to be. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I became a photographer. I was a baseball player in college, and then I became an actor after that, which is a, kind of an also an adrenaline-themed kind of career. And I was doing that for a while, and then I went on a bike ride uh, up to the top of a mountain, and I saw that. And I t this is in uh, Cadillac Mountain in Maine. And I saw this view, and I really wanted to know how to take a good photograph of it, but I realized I had no idea. So on the way down the mountain, I decided to take a photography course to learn. And I took it at SVA, as a matter of fact. It was a black and white printing class way back in the day, before there was digital. And the first picture I ever took was this. 
and it really grabbed me. I don't know how many of you have had this moment, but when I saw that print come up in the developer, it was like a hallelujah moment for me. And I suddenly realized this is what I wanted to do, but how was I going to do it? So I carried my Pentax K1000 around for a while, you know, doing street photography. And then I started realizing, you know, I'm a waiter and a lot of actors are waiters. And so I started photographing uh, actors uh, for their headshots, but I was doing it a different way. This is the first um, headshot I took of a hostess at City Crab and Seafood Company, which is now defunct recently. And uh, all headshots at the time looked like this. And they were black and white studio shots. And I started taking people out into environments and doing environmental portraiture. And they look like this. I don't know if anybody's seen Spotlight. Have you guys all seen Spotlight? He's one of the stars of Spotlight. It's a phenomenal movie, by the way. Just side note, if you haven't seen it, you should. And so I was just, you know, using environment to kind of help determine their type and to suggest type. And we would just go around to various places and shoot them. And it's an awesomely fun career, by the way. And as I was doing all of these photographs, um, one day I was playing with my son, who's this little guy. <laughs> now, he's not that little anymore, but when he was three, I was watching him play with his toy bus. And he had this level of enthusiasm for his fantasy life that I realized I didn't share. And as he was getting more excited about whatever was going on in his head, I had this sudden realization, you know, as adults, we kind of bypass the small everyday moments in, in, in search of the big things. And I wanted to create a body of work that might show the everyday in a beautiful, exciting way. And I suddenly realized, wow, I could use dancers to show how beautiful the everyday could be, but I had never photographed a dancer before. So the first thing was to find them. And I had just done the portraits of somebody with the Paul Taylor Dance Company. And I asked him, do you think some of your dancers would be interested in doing this with me? They had never uh, heard of me because I had never taken a single dance photograph and I had no idea that they were also one of the top 10 dance companies in the world. But fortunately I got them on a period of time when they were off and about eight or ten of them volunteered and started walking around the streets with me uh, in New York City as I was trying to discover what this project was. And The first shot we ever took was this. And then later that day I took that shot. And I thought, oh, now this is something kind of cool. I've never really seen this before. Like, you know, he's hailing a cab, but he's doing it in this beautiful, exciting way. And I started getting excited. And I started taking more pictures like this. And I showed them to a friend of mine who's a photographer. And he said, well, wait a minute. This is not a long lens project. You're not blurring out the background. This is Among Us. Where's the Among Us? You got to get some people out there. So I went out of my comfort zone and I grabbed a 28 millimeter lens. I called the initial inspiration from Paul Taylor. And I said, let's just go in the subway and see what we create. And that is when I really got excited because I thought, now this is a story. It makes the everyday beautiful. It's, a, it's something that we can all relate to, the moment of commuting, trying to get to catch a train. And I spent a lot more time shooting with them. And fortunately, I saw this photograph by Richard Avedon. And it inspired me to grab another one of their dancers and wait for a rainstorm. And I took this picture. So that I had this life of shooting them for about two months and I put together a large body of work of their dancers and this is a thing I did that I don't recommend anybody do but I sent them all to Paul Taylor Dance Company I said here you go these are your photos now you can have them for free I just want you to appreciate them and maybe show them at your you know at your sh shows and this that and the other they absolutely love them they couldn't believe this gift I was giving them they said thank you very much and then Paul Taylor to my great fortune said, no, thank you, because they were not of his dances. They were just of his dancers, and he wanted to represent his company only in, in his own construction of his dances. So they passed. And then I thought, well, the whole reason I was doing this was to give them to Paul Taylor, so now I don't know what to do with them. And it kind of died, and I thought I was done. But this photo was selected by PDN Online as photo of the day, and it just struck the right chord at the right moment. And all of a sudden, it went viral. And I got several emails, lots of emails actually, from people who were interested, and the Daily News wrote to me, and they said, can we put one of your pictures in our paper? I said, you could do that, or you could come with me on a day of shooting, and we'll go to places we're not allowed to be, and maybe I'll get kicked out and get in trouble, and you can document the whole thing, which they did. And so they, instead of doing one photo, they did a four-page spread. And this is what that looked like, all from shots we took that day except that one. And at the end of the, the, the run, it got even more interest. And I was fortunate enough to have the only literary agent in all of the world who reads the Daily News. <laughs> and he read that issue. 
And he called me up and he said, I think this can be a book. And this is how he would do it, because he he's a well-known uh, agent, and therefore he could get me into any um, publisher. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried to have a book. I, I had a book before that I had to self-publish. It's really hard. A photography book just doesn't sell, and they're naturally inclined to not like it, so he didn't tell them anything. He would only say, I'm bringing somebody in. You need to see these photographs. And this is how it would go in every case. We would lay them out for the editor. I'd bring in about 25 11 by 14 prints. And these people all love the photos. These are different. These are great. Man, we got to do a book on this. I've never seen anything like this. A couple of times, they even laid out some spreads in front of me. Two people cried, which was wild to see them crying about these pictures. And I said to my agent, w are we going to get a deal? And he said, there's going to be a crazy bidding war on this. And then in every case, the publishers sent them back to their sales departments. And the sales departments always said, pass, this will never sell. Who wants to buy dance photos, especially all set in New York City? Because at that time, I had shot everything in New York City. So we uh, basically assumed it was completely dead. Months later, I got a call from Workman Publishing, who I had ironically met before, but a different division of Workman. And they, and they said, we'd like to bring you in and maybe discuss a calendar. Why did they even call me? Because a junior editor at the time had seen one of the pictures online and it made her happy. So she hung it up in her cubicle just to keep herself happy every day. And people would walk by and say, oh, that's neat. And she said, we should really talk to this guy. They say, nah, dance photography. And they'd pass it. Eventually, this junior editor was so determined to get me in the room, she said, what about a calendar? Just meet him for a calendar. They brought me in for the calendar. And at that time, I said, well, what about a book? We've been talking to people about a book. And they said, you know, they're beautiful pictures, but dance photographs in New York City, nobody's going to buy that. I said, that's OK, because this summer I'm going to travel around the country, which was a complete lie. I just didn't want to hear no again. So I lied, and they said, well, that sounds kind of interesting. And I, I had to, at that point, go around the country. Mm -hmm. So the first shot I took was this one in Maryland. And I sent it back to them. And they're like, oh, OK, now this is, this is good. This makes sense to us now. And then they signed me up for a book, and we spent, I spent a year traveling around. That's what the video was, shooting for everything. And then when the book came out, to my great fortune, it became a New York Times bestseller, and that was the cover. And I then went back a year later to that very same spot that I had started on Cadillac Mountain, and I took my landscape photo. So it's been a really incredible run because the, the success of the book has afforded me so many opportunities. I've gotten to travel the world. I've had calendars. It has sold a ton. It's in its eighth or tenth or something printing at this point. And, um, and I've had exhibitions everywhere. And it's just a really miraculous, exciting journey that even leads me here. I'm going to show you some of the photos uh, from this project and tell you exactly how they happened uh, because they're kind of difficult to make happen. Now, you have to remember, first thing, there's no Photoshop in any of these pictures. So, I mean, OK, some people get particular. Yes, we color corrected and all that. But there's no manipulation of the images. What you see is what actually happened. And I was very determined to do it that way because I think there's a lot of cynicism about photography now. And you look at a picture and you just don't believe it's real. So I've had people film me so that, they can, so that we can prove that it's real. And I wrote, wrote about it in the book. So they were actually able to do this thing in one take. It took 55 tries to get that one take. And the problem with this, this is an extremely difficult thing to do. Here's how it went. And remember, leap and the net will appear. Everything I do is serendipity. I never have a plan. I just have dancers meet me wherever we meet, and then we go out, and I just look around, and I try and figure it out. And I'm looking for a story to tell. So I had them all meeting me uh, in Rockefeller Center because it was, you know, the holidays. And as I was walking there, I saw this building, the Cartier building. I thought, well, that has to be the background. But what is the story? And as I was walking to meet them, I saw this guy here. And I asked him if 20 bucks made it into his pocket and not the pail, would he stand there for 15 minutes and let me take a photo? And he said, sure. And it turned into an hour, which is, I think, why he looks a little pissed off <laughs> at this point. Um, so then I went over to the guy and said, OK, I've got Salvation Army. You're donating to the Salvation Army. That's the story. What can you all do in unison? And one of them said, well, we can do this. These are five guys from the Broadway show Newsies. Now, what is this? I'm going to show you what this is. And I'm, I, I'm not going to do it as well as they did because I just don't want to embarrass them. But they would basically get on their hands and knees. Now, they had my money in their right hand. I said, you can't let go of that money because that's uh, like $2. And <laughs> so they had to push off and then land with their left hands. What they would do is they would go down here like this. And then I go, one, two, three. And they go, yeah. <coughs> right. 
in slow motion, that actually looks good. <laughs> Extend out and then land on their left hand. Eventually, they did this 55 times. Of the many challenges were getting them all in line at the same time, jumping at the same moment, having nobody behind them, no cars, nothing behind them, no pedestrians walking in front of me. There was a huge crowd at this point watching. There was a security guard behind me trying to stop me from doing it because I was blocking his doorway. And these are some of the wa times they didn't work. 54 times they didn't work. There would be something behind them, of course, or people. That's a killer. Look, they nailed it. And then those two guys. <laughs> Now, you know that we could retouch that out, right? I would just take a flat shot of this, and then you could put each of them in there individually, but we didn't do that. We had to get it. The cab, of course, but what often happen is four of them would nail it, and usually this dude <laughs> was a little low, and I'd have to go back, and I'd have to say very politely, I know, I know this is hard, and you're hurting, but you're just going a little bit late or a little bit earlier, whatever you're doing. Is that right? So we kept doing that. People would walk in the shot. You know, they were giving it away with their legs. This one is so close, but you can see a couple of their hands are like, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. This one was extremely close, except his face is blocked and the hands are down. And then finally, we got this shot. I didn't know if we had gotten it, and I went over to talk to them and give them notes. And then I saw there was a little blood on the ground. And I said, what's that? And the guy in the green, he held up his hand, it's bleeding. He says, I'm fine, I'm fine then. And I normally would have said, okay, let's keep going. Except there was a German television station, RTL, filming this whole thing for a bio on the book. And I couldn't have them film me and, say, and see me say, yeah, keep going. So we just luckily got that. I didn't know we had gotten it. There is a video that they made, or you know, the thing there. I'll just show you what this looked like in real time. People traffic, uh, getting all, all the dancers uh, in line in the exact same pose. Uh, the people walking behind them, the shot, the, the traffic, the, guy, the security guard that wants me to stop. It, it's almost impossible. We're going to get it though. Ready? Let's do it again. Here we go. You can do it. All right, here's another shot. Um, there's a, a dancer named Michaela de Prince who has a movie called First Position about her life as well as a few other dancers. Uh, and she's just a, a remarkable story. Um, she was uh, from Sierra Leone and her parents were killed and she was brought here by an adoptive family. And they, she was always told she could never be a dancer because uh, she's black and the ballet c world just doesn't like that, apparently. And also because she has a skin disorder, so she has white spots all over her body. But she has become one of the most celebrated dancers in the world, and there's going to be a movie about her life and a best-selling memoir is being made into a movie. So she's really remarkable. I had the good fortune to have an hour with her in Massachusetts a couple of years ago. And the only idea I had as I was driving down this path, I thought, oh, this path would be interesting. Um, maybe you're hitchhiking, I asked her to bring a backpack, and that was the extent of it. We got there and we started working on something. And that's the story, right? There she is, she's kind of bored, she's sitting like this, and there's a backpack, and it's perfectly nice, and it was going pretty well. And then a car drove by, and uh, trying to get past us, and out of the, the back seat of the car, a dog stu stuck his head out. And I suddenly realized, well, that's the shot. So I chased down the car to get the dog, say, excuse me, excuse me, can I borrow your dog? And they're like, okay. Turns out this dog is central casting dog. Like, I could have looked high and low for months, and I wouldn't have gotten a better dog than that dog. <laughs> but the problem was that I wanted them both looking forward, right? So we did this. She did this jump maybe 50 or 60 times. Every time the dog might look forward or the dog would jump, but she would miss it or whatever, or I would miss it. And then eventually she said, can I try a different pose? I just, there's something I think I could do here that might be interesting. I said, sure, and she did this. 
And that just blew my mind. <laughs> we still had to get the dog to sit still. Now, you know, once again, with Photoshop, I could easily just take one picture of him, say thank you very much, and just plop him in whenever we're done. But that's not the way we wanted it to happen. It had to happen in the camera. So when we finally got this moment, and I'm sure you've all had this experience, I saw in the camera, and I realized it's perfect. And then I just froze for a second, please be in focus. <laughs> because, you know, Nikon is not always consistent and reliable with their focus. And then it was in focus, and we had a very big celebratory moment. Uh, it was very exciting. And that picture has gone uh, very viral and has been seen everywhere. Uh, the only picture that might equal that in terms of popularity from shots I've taken was taken a few months ago in Chicago. And that really doesn't need a whole lot of explanation other than how in the world did she do that. And I was doing a lot of other shots throughout that evening, and she was a part of it. And then at the end, she said, I have this little party trick I do. I don't know if you'd be interested. And she said she could balance on point on a wine bottle, and she had brought the wine bottle. And I said, OK, how? And this, this is the shortest shoot I've ever done. I looked at it last night. It was two seconds. OK, here it is. There she goes, right? She's ready to go. This person's running out, okay? One second later, she hits that pose. One second later, she's falling off. One second later, it's shattered. So we got the shot in two seconds. Um, one more uh, Dancers Among Us shot I want to show you is also kind of unbelievable. And this is the idea of being flexible. And one of the reasons why I really like serendipity so much is that... Um, I met this woman in Philadelphia, and we were shooting. It was uh, pouring out and, and very cold, and she just, was, just felt like it was just too cold to be able to do anything good. So there was a hotel right nearby, and we went in, and we said, can we use your bathroom? And then we just snuck around until we found something. And then we, she told me that she could do this crazy thing if we found just the right walls, that she would be able to put herself in that position, but we still had to get the key because there still has to be a story. So then somebody walked by and said, can I just... Sounds a little creepy. Can I borrow your key <laughs> for just two minutes while we take this picture? And then she was able to just hold herself up there for two minutes. Um, so the, this exhibition at the 92nd Street Y has a lot of photographs that are blown up very big on aluminum. They're gorgeous. I would suggest to go look at it if you like these pictures. I am going to take you to the next body of work, and there's a video that will introduce it to you. Jordan, before you play that, I have a question. Um, in situations like the Salvation Army or the Jeffrey Ballet, mm -hmm. does do the once the picture is made, does it ever like come back to that? Do they like the Salvation Army might use that picture, or did that dancer actually belong to Jeffrey Ballet? Or oh, okay, uh, no, she did. She didn't belong to Jeffrey Ballet. Um, it, we just happened that the thing that was great about that was, you know, we were saying, well, where could like we were a block away. And I was like, uh, like, well, okay, that sounds cool, but where could we possibly shoot it? Like, what, what are we going to do? I don't know. It's just in the middle of the street. I don't know. And I'm turning in circles, and then she says, um, <laughs> it's a ballet company right there, like the most, one of the most famous in the world. So we put that there. I have no idea if they've ever seen it. Just like the Salvation Army. I don't know. And the, the deal with rights is, you know, if you're going to, if I, I couldn't put that in an advertisement without their okay, or without the okay of the wine bottle. Um, same thing with Salvation Army. You can't use it for advertisement. You can't put it on the cover of a book or the cover of a calendar. But you can put it on the interior of a book because they can't really make an argument that you made money on their image since there's about 200 pictures in there. Okay. So, uh, so, so what's happened here is that the, the book was very successful, as I said. And so it went from you're not going to um, have, you know, like any luck having a book, and then it went to, all right, what's our next book? What's our next book? And so I tried several things on the Among Us theme, right? So I shot Athletes Among Us, and I shot Circus Among Us, and they were cool shots, and you can see the websites, and, and the publishers liked them, but it was, they didn't feel excited. Then I started working on a body of work that I never considered to be a book, and I'm still shocked that they're going to make it one. Um, but... Uh, I just did it for my own personal interest because I loved the process and because I thought it was visually different and maybe it would go in galleries or whatever. And it became this. So this, this video was made by um, a company that does original content for iPhones. And they asked me if they could just follow me around for one night of shooting this new project that I'm going to show you now.
Yeah, first of all, this isn't necessarily a legal thing that we're doing. Take dancers naked outside at night in public. I don't plan shoots. I just, my mind doesn't work that way. I am freaking out right now. We have to get that shot. Shit, shit, go, go. Would they have called somebody? We have to do it again. It's not perfect yet. It's almost just like, how much courage do you have? I think this is our chance now or never, and we just have to do it. Oh, shit, shit, shit. Here comes the officers right now. I've got bail. I'm Jordan Matter. I'm a photographer in New York City. We're on our way to St. Patrick's Cathedral. When I look over and I see that column in Rockefeller Center and it's illuminated. I mean, when you get a sign that tells you that you're in an iconic spot, include the sign in the photo. If I can get a dancer right in the center of that thing, that could be pretty spectacular, but there's a ton of security in Rockefeller Center and there's tourists all over taking the same shot I want to take. So I don't know how we're going to do this. This is great because I am freaking out right now. We have to get that shot at some point. There's going to be a moment, and when that moment comes, I'm going to want Harper to just rush that thing and get in and out before security sees us. We see a break in the crowd. Harper has to just take his clothes off and rush up. Hit it. Hit him from right there. Go. Don't panic. Hit it. Do it a couple more times. One more time. Yes. Get down. Get down. Get down. Oh, my god. He jumped up there and put his foot right in the center of that sign. And that's what makes the shot, that he's dead center. His energy is contagious. And you feel how excited he is. So you're like, yeah, I'm excited too. I want to do this. If you think that was Harry, what we're about to do yeah. is like crazier. I'm so excited. <laughs> we're right next to St. Patrick's Cathedral. There's no reason not to do that now, but this is Harry. This is literally the scariest location I've ever chosen. If I'm not terrified, it's not gonna be a good shot, and I am terrified of St. Patrick's Cathedral. This is 10 seconds. You need to just drop them and hit it, and we have to beg the, the heavens to keep us safe. <laughs> it's kind of that thing, right? <laughs> there are video monitors, there's 24 seven police surveillance. I have absolutely no idea how we're gonna get this shot. No, right, that's not gonna work. We, I can't find this photo. I don't know. Let's go look at the other thing. Where are we going to put these dancers and still get the scope of the cathedral in the shot? I got to find an angle that gives me both. Across the street, I came back, I looked around the side, but it's none of that. It is dead center right there on the stairs, because if you're not there, it's not scary. We do this once. I hope it's in focus. We get out of here. It's very important to me that this doesn't look like exploitation that I'm not saying, ha ha, we got naked in front of a famous cathedral. Well, I want it to be like you're, you're kind of giving yourself to God in a way. And then if people have an issue, at least we are able to say this is what we're trying to say. And I want the pose to be some sort of thing with a lift and a bend as if it's just washing over them. That, that way, just like that. That's, That's the pose, okay? For some reason right now, there are no police in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral. They've practiced the pose a couple times. I've adjusted the lighting. I'm ready to go. We just have to shoot it and see what happens. Is everybody ready? Go. Right in the center. One step forward that way. Go. It happens so fast that you don't even realize it's happening. I'm not thinking anymore if there's police. I'm not thinking if there's pedestrians. I'm only thinking I've got about a 15 second window here to take this shot and make it good. Come down. No, that's pretty. I need to do it again. Are you ready? I turn to them and I say, we got to do it again. And the look in their eyes was like, oh man. Like, I thought we got it. But they were up for it. They were ready to go. There's no time to ask questions or ask them if it's OK. We have to do it again. It's not perfect yet. Hit him. Hit him hard with the light. Hold it. Hold it. Done. OK. This time, I had my game a little bit more on, and they still nailed their game. And the, the pose that they hit was just spectacular. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> I look so skinny.
This is my first time in New York, so doing everything like sightseeing and what most tourists do naked was pretty thrilling. Two photos in the bag, and I'm thinking, well, where do we go next? Now they're adrenaline addicted, so we're gonna go to Grand Central Station. As soon as I walk in, I see the great hall and the clock and the windows and the iconic spot. The police officers are right there. Security is everywhere. So I figure, well, let's keep it above security and get them low below the barrier so that people won't even see them. And it just looked like a cop out. It looked like I was scared. What if we weren't trying to hide you? Is this the best or is it just we're doing it because we're trying to hide her? I feel like this is a pretty shot, but it's not like, what? I suggest we walk around the perimeter of the room and see if we find one spot where they're hidden. It's a question of if it's gorgeous enough to take a risk with all the security around. We have to be out here. Like, there's no, I don't think there's any hiding it. When we tried to hide around the corners, it just doesn't have the magnificence or the daring. It was pretty clear that Reyna was the one that was going to do the shot. And she's always been up for anything. She turned to me, she said, I'm an international student. I could get deported, and I'm nervous about that. I don't know if I have the balls to sit there, but be good with all those cops around, yeah, so I'm I not think, American. I, think, <laughs> I thought we'd be done, but I said, let's just look around. At the very least, let's go back to the spot we saw. That was almost completely one. private with the spotlight. Yeah. This beautiful hallway had a spotlight from a chandelier shining down on it. And it was obviously serendipity because the location is more beautiful than anything we had seen before. Okay, okay, listen, guys, are you ready? Go. On your spot, look at that light. Hold it right there. She held it for a long time, but a guy was on the balcony and wouldn't leave and was just staring at her. And it kind of killed the whole shot for me. And as soon as it was empty, we did it one more time with the same pose. Second time it rocked, man. It fucking rocked. Once I get in the pose, all I hear is hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And nothing around me matters, just the pose matters, and if we got it. I got that shot, I just did this moment where you just hold your breath and hope it's in focus. I hit the zoom, it was sharp as a tack. We got it. Oh! Wow! Ha! Huh? Group hug. That was amazing. So Before tonight, I was certainly burned out on New York, not gonna shoot here anymore. Now I can't wait to get back on the streets. I don't know where I'm gonna go next. I only know that I have to equal what I've just done. And that's not gonna be easy. So yeah, that's different from Dancers Among Us. And um, I'm going to take you through uh, one photo shoot that was documented by a wonderful photographer, so you'll see some behind the scenes stuff to kind of tell you what the process is like more specifically. Um, and uh, that, this happened just a, about two weeks ago. Anyway, I was at the gym and I had, I had this sudden thought of a big group of naked ballerinas uh, in point shoes <laughs> and buns in the middle of the street. And then I thought the next thing was, Fuck, that's hard. How am I gonna do that? And, and the weather report told me that the following evening was gonna be the one moderately warm night of, of, of the foreseeable future. So I started trying to gather ballerinas, many of whom I'd never met. And I showed up in uh, Barnes and Noble uh, in Union Square to nine dancers ready to have this adventure. And now we had to figure out, well, what are we gonna do? I don't like research pose, research anything ever, but I don't research poses because I don't want to be constrained by that, like to, like to come in with an idea that doesn't allow us to kind of come up with something collaboratively. So instead, we went right outside of Union Square and we just started trying to figure out the pose. And I had no idea, so we started building it piece by piece and there was a lot of assistants that were there to help and everybody was chiming in and I'm really a big believer on let everybody have an opinion you know you're not just holding a light you're collaborating the dancers are collaborating and we started put together this pose and some somebody suggested that it would be like a, a wave with their arms of water now to make it even harder you know because this is a project of, n of naked bodies but if you want to have anybody seen them then most of them have to be covered so all the important parts and I'm just gonna use technical terms here but butt crack uh, and nipples, 
you can't see them if there's any chance of putting them on Facebook or Instagram. So I told them, in addition to this very difficult thing we have to do, we also have to come up with a pose that's going to cover everything. So we started rehearsing. As, as you can see, we started working with this water flow in their bodies and connecting them all. And how do we cover everything? And this took a, a couple of hours, at least, to come up with it. And then eventually we thought, okay, we have the pose. Now where are we going to shoot it? And I figured, well, let's go to 6th Avenue and do it right in the middle of the avenue. We went over to 6th Avenue, and it's kind of ugly. You know, the avenues in New York City are ugly and dark. And in this case, um, it, was, it was particularly ugly because it was just this gross pavement. And I thought the only place that has beautiful pavement, and since this is such a wide shot, the pavement's going to be very important, is the meatpacking district. And it was a Friday night. I don't know if any of you go to the meatpacking district on a Friday night, but that's not the kind of crowd you want to have nine naked women in. But we went there. So we went to the meatpacking district. We found this. I mean, it was so busy. It's this spot right here. And they start practicing it. And it's the only spot that's not an actual street, but it's surrounded by streets all around. So there are th four different openings of cars. And there were police driving by, and not, this is an exaggeration, every two or three minutes. Now let me talk a little bit about the police, because this is illegal, um, and uh, I'm not an adrenaline junkie in that way. It's not like I'm trying to push the limits and get arrested or anything like that. Um, but I photographed a, a police lieutenant, and I asked him, well, okay, these are, these are the photos I'm taking. What you, what, what's the risk here? And he said, you know, look, cops are municipal workers. They just want to do the least they have to do and get home. And I don't see anybody giving you a hard time unless they're looking for overtime. So if you're unlucky enough to find somebody looking for overtime, you're going to be in trouble. I had one experience right before this in Inwood, where I was photographing a young woman. I thought we were totally hidden. Next thing I know, there's three police cars. And six cops get out, and there's sirens blaring, and they're all around. And they, they asked me, you know, like, okay, we, what are you doing? And I tried the art project, blah, blah, blah. And he said, uh, you know, and he got stuck on, you know, um, this lighting is illegal because I use a roto light. I don't know if you know it, but you know, it was on the thing. I said... And this was a mistake, too. Don't do this. But I said, officer, I'm sure you know the law better than I do, but my understanding is um, if I have a tripod, then I need a permit. But if I don't have a tripod, then I think it's legal. And he said, okay, well, then why don't you go downtown and you can discuss that with the judge. He turns to the woman and says, do you have ID? And uh, she said, no, no, officer, it's back in my apartment around the block. He said, you're coming downtown, too. And he was taking us both downtown to arrest us and give us summons and all that. And then I said... I don't want to make this worse, but a lieutenant friend of mine ha ha gave me this and said to give it to you if this happens. Now, there's six officers watching, and I handed him a thing called a courtesy card. A courtesy card is kind of like a get-out-of-jail-free card, but I had never had to use it before. And he looked at it and he said, oh, uh, Lieutenant Walker, where does he work? Where's his precinct? I said, it's in the Bronx. <laughs> and he said, oh, that's interesting, because precinct 607, last time I checked, was Brooklyn. <laughs> like, oh, well... I don't know, but he's a buddy. And so then they all conferred, and then they said, all right, you're good, and then told us, you know, don't ever do this again, da, 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 and we left. So now I'm here, and I'm feeling a little more bold, because I'm like, well, are they going to arrest nine women? I mean, that would be crazy, but still, you don't know, and the police are driving around. So we keep practicing it. It's freezing at this point, by the way, and we're just trying to get, now you get, the, the way you do this project is you get down to very little, but whatever's legal, and you take the shot, you practice the shot. In this case, um, everybody was noticing, of course, that all these naked ballerinas, and they were stopping, and they were talking about it and everything, and watching all over the place. And what would happen is we would shoot it for a while, and then we would gather, and we would look at the picture, and they're shaking and cold. And then what happened? We did a few takes of it, and it started to rain. And then everything was better because it started to rain. And all of a sudden, that beautiful cobblestone street was getting wet and illuminated, and we're out there. And this is what it looked like when we were shooting it from behind. And they kept getting colder and colder, and I would look at it, and what would happen is one of them would slightly miss. It would be like eight of them are nailing it, and one exposed her breast just a little bit, or one wasn't on point just enough, and we're pouring rain now. We're looking through, and we say, I'm sorry. We just have to do it again. And the thing I always remind myself is, they're going to hate me now, but tomorrow when they're warm and they're fine, they're going to want a beautiful picture of themselves. And I just keep trying to remind them and myself that that's the case. We have to keep pushing it until we get it. And then finally, on the ninth try, and each shoot was about one minute, and every time we'd shoot, they'd throw their coats on and a police officer would drive by. It was the most incredible luck. We never got caught, and on the ninth shot, we got that. 
and that was fun. All right, so now I'm going to let you guys help me with something. Um, so we're in the midst of putting this book together, and uh, they have started to work on the cover. Like, what's going to be the cover image? And this is hard, because you can't show any nudity on a cover, and it's a book of naked people. So they've mocked up a few covers, and I have three finalists for you, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you all three, and then I'm going to go back, and I'm going to have you each applaud at whichever one you like the most. And then I'm going to tell the publishers this was the unanimous favorite, if there's a unanimous favorite. You got to applaud at one, at least. Okay, so here's the three covers. Okay, nope, don't start clapping. Okay, did you see the three? Everybody have their turn? Okay, so we're going to go, with, tell, tell me your feelings on cover number one. Okay, cover number two. Can't tell a difference. Cover number three. That one wins, it sounds, right? We'd agree? That one won? Okay. Good information to come back to them with. Okay. School of Visual Arts, yes. Educated community. Educated community. There you go. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Um, so, now here was the thing. They, the, the publishers were anxious to do a follow-up book, and they signed on. Now, this Workman Publishing does things like what to expect when you're expecting, and... Um, God, what else? Uh, you know, all of those how-to books, right? Dancers Among Us was a big departure from anything to do a photography book. To then do um, a book of, of nudes, even if they're semi-nude, was a real departure. But they signed on because we really hadn't come up with anything after a couple of years. Then the next day, I came up with an idea. After we, they had signed on and said yes, I said, I've got another idea for you that I think would be really great. So could we work on this as well? And let me show you a little video of what that is. So that idea came to me because I was shoveling snow in my driveway, and um, my daughter was helping me. And then I said, you just look so cute. I'm going to take a picture. And when I grabbed my camera, because she's see you know, she doesn't really do dance, but she's seen me do this. And then she did that pose. And then I thought, oh my god, Tiny Dancers Among Us. How did I ever not think about this? But the thing was, when I was doing Dancers Among Us, I did reach out to several kids 
And what they did was like, okay, and it was cute, and a couple ended up in the book, but it wasn't really spectacular, so I didn't know anything about competition dance, and I didn't know really how incredible these kids could be. But if you imagine, this is my five-year-old daughter, and just imagine that since she was two, she had been practicing dance six days a week, three to four hours a day, and she was now six, this is what she could do. And so suddenly I was realizing, wow, these kids are really unbelievably good. And it's the same idea of taking them out, finding a story, and, then, and the thing that's unbelievable. I mean, I have two kids, and I think, man, I cannot imagine them putting three or four hours a day into something. And the amount of commitment that these kids have to what it is that they want to do with their lives blows my mind. And it's really like you can't do that with your feet. It's just not right to be able to bend back and do that. Or this you know and so I had what however many kids that is and I had a couple of hours in in oh, I can't remember where I was um, and and we all went in for cookies and then you go in for cookies and you realize well this is really photogenic and next thing you know we're constructing a shot you know kid by kid and um, let me just show you I'll show you what this is was in Miami a couple of weeks ago and I'll show you what this looks like just very very quick all right when you're ready let it rip Okay, so that was just a little slow motion Instagram. By the way, always making videos along with your photos is pretty fun. So I'll, I'll take shots of kids, you know, and this took us maybe 30 jumps to get. And then I say, okay, and they're done. And they say, okay, now we got to do it again for video. And then sometimes, you know, uh, when your wor work gets out there, what's exciting is you kind of inspire other artists to create stuff based on your work, and that's what this is. So that's Tiny Dancers Among Us. That's coming out in 2017. Next year, uh, I mean this year in October, Dancers After Dark is coming out. Um, and even as I speak, uh, there are dancers gathering here or downstairs, and we are going out for a Dancers After Dark adventure, and I'll tell you guys, I have no idea what we're gonna do. And there's gonna be six or seven of you, and I'm looking once again, middle of an avenue, or a sidewalk, or in the snow, or something fun like that. So that's how it goes. You get people and you just kind of like, Put yourself into the situation and trust that when you're in the situation, you're going to make something work. And I think the biggest thing that stops people from creating something special is that they just say no rather than yes. And just to end on this thought, um, Dancers Among Us I shot for about six months or a year or more before there was any interest from publishers. And uh, Dancers After Dark I've been shooting for a year and a half. Um, and in almost every case, I've always struggle with the idea, do I go out today and do this? I mean, I have a day job, I do portraiture, that's what pays the bills. I could just go home and then I could see my kids, you know, and I could kiss them goodnight and play with them. And so many times I make the decision instead to go out and to create something, I don't know where it's gonna go. Um, and, and that commitment to sticking with something that excites you, even in the low times when nothing's working, you just stick with it and just keep going out and it does become something and it's almost in the doing of it that you find it and discover it. And if you try to look for the end goal too quickly, you might never discover it. It's like Human of New York, right? You, I mean, everybody knows that. A year, think, every single day he had 3,000 Facebook fans at the end of a year. Walked around every day interviewing people, no idea where it was gonna go. Now we all know where it went. But he had to go out there for a year first and do it every day. A every success story that you hear starts with people committing to something even when nobody else believes in it. And so if you have an idea, Commit to it because it will become something special and then you get to come here and talk about yourself, which is awesome. That's it. Those are my Facebook and Instagram. If you want to follow me, I post every day. And I'm ready for questions. I kept this under an hour by eight minutes because I said, oh, it might go a little longer. And he was like, thank you very much. So we have uh, time for a quick Q&A plus eight minutes uh, extra. A eight minutes, and that's one question for me. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll pass around the mic. It's not gonna make your voice louder, it's just for the video, but please use it. Hi, Hi. I love your work. You. I used to be a dancer, so I really appreciate what you do. Um, but my question is, as you work with dancers, do they have to sign model releases, or what is that like legal procedure that you have? I had an attorney draw up model release. Okay. Yeah. 
and they sign it after every shoot. Uh, and it basically gives me rights to do anything I want with the photos. Um, I don't have people in the background sign releases because it's really hard if you're shooting hundreds of pictures. Um, and I do know, once again, that if you put anybody's image on the cover or on the cover of a calendar or in an advertisement, you have to have their release. But it's street photography, so if they're caught in the background of, of a shot in the interior of a book, th they, there's nothing that they can do about that. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I've been following your work for a while, and like I love it. I'm a sophomore here at SVA. I'm a photo major. And okay, <laughs> and I'm really into like dance photography. That's what I want to do. But I was just wondering how like you recruit all your dancers and how you get like more followers and stuff on Instagram. I don't know if everyone heard. She said two things. First, she said, "Wow, you're really really cute." I'm sorry, <laughs> you're married. <laughs> <laughs> and then after she asked me how I got get the dancers. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm sorry too because you're also really cute and it could have worked <laughs> out. Like I felt something. Um, and then uh, for the for the getting of the dancers. Uh, when I first started, you know, that I would have to approach people. Um, at this point, fortunately, I have a really good uh, social media presence. So what I'll do is if I'm, I'm going to Austin next week, and I haven't posted about it yet, but I kind of posted I might come, and I got dancers that way. Usually I'll just post, I'm going to say I'm going to be in this city or this town, and then people submit. And with dancers among us, that's really not a challenge at all. Uh, because also now for dancers, their reality is they need to be posting every day to be relevant on social media, right? So they're doing so many selfies, but if they can get like a free shoot of themselves and get some cool pictures for themselves, they want to. A very easy trade-off. I have been surprised how many people have volunteered for Dancers After Dark. Could you just stand up for a second, please? Please, just stand <laughs> up for a second. I would like to just uh, introduce everybody to this beautiful woman, Mande. Look at her. Okay, first of all, this is the third time she's doing this. <laughs> I mean, I can't even believe it. Like a, a beautiful dancer and woman like this will come out and say, "I trust you." And such a—it's it's just really an honor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Like she'll be like, the, like naked. She's like, yeah. Hey, don't. So, but you know, I, when we met, she's like, "I don't really want to do that." And, and next thing you know, now this is her third time. And and the thing is, it's an incredible amount of trust. It really is. And so I I, I just appreciate and respect so much um, why why they do it and what they do it for. And it really that book is really about a celebration of dancers. I mean, it's not it's not supposed to be gratuitous in any way. The whole idea of it is, you know, each of us will have a passion, and we may spend ten thousand hours on that passion, but you can't see it etched in our bodies. And when they go out there in public and you see their muscles and you see what they can do with their bodies, you realize like to succeed, you need to put in that kind of effort. And not only that, but then being outside and being in public at night, it kind of shows the whole vulnerability of dreaming big. And you know, you may fail, but if you don't dream, you'll never know, all those cliches. So that's what the book is about. And I'm really excited that so many people are willing to come on board and do it. And then the kids, man, well, that's all about their moms. And that's a little weird, I have to be honest. And I'm not generalizing, there's never been a dad. I've never met a dance dad. But like the moms, like, like they control the kids' Instagram account. You know, so then they'll be like, I had such a great time with you, Jordan. And you know the mom wrote that. And the whole thing is bizarre. And they really, like one, there's one shot, I just remember just to give you an idea of how hard these kids are pushed sometimes, where uh, it, last winter, I think it was last winter, it was just freezing, I don't know if you remember. But I, I had these three dancers on uh, the Hudson River, like right next to it in the ice. And it was gusty. I was still treating them like they were adults because I was used to adults. And one of them started shaking and she was turning blue. And she's like, I have to stop. I said, that's totally fine. The car's right there. Go in and get warm. Go in there. And her mom went in. I said, I'm just going to keep shooting these two kids for just another second, but you did awesome. Her mom comes in and she goes, you want your friends to be in the book and not you? Ooh. Right? And then two minutes later, she comes out like, I'm ready. And her mom goes, I knew you could do it. I knew you were tough. It's like, oh, God, that's weird. So I feel for the kids a little, you know, and if you ever go to dance competitions and you see like all the makeup they wear, it's really bizarre. But when you get them out of that context, they really do love what they do. And, and obviously, you know, they have this joy for it that's really contagious. It's a long answer, but I have eight extra minutes. Oh, I missed that because of the cute thing. Yeah. The, for the keeping up social media, uh, there's several things about that. You have to be posting regularly, you know. I haven't done Snapchat yet. I know one has to. I, I, I just, it's just exhausting, you know, because that's like documenting everything all the time. Um, but, but, you know, building up a presence is really about two things, I think. I think one is always being relevant. 
Um, I just wrote an article for a photo magazine about viral images and how that happens, and there's certain things I think relevance is one of them. So if you, if you post something like there's a storm, winter storm and you post a photograph in the storm, it's more likely to get a lot of attention than if you post something on a sunny day, right? Um, and the other thing is about something I think that people feel good sharing. So you want imagery that not people won't just like, but they'll also want to show their friends. And usually, though not always, there's either a shock value to that, or there's a cute thing, or there's a beauty thing. Right? So th there's a lot of projects out there that are dance-related projects, ballerina project, um, and there's a lot of other ph photographers who do dance photography. And basically what they do, it's all kind of the same thing. But they do a lot of really pretty pictures, you know. So they'll go out somewhere and they're a pretty picture on Fifth Avenue. Pretty, there's never a really a story, but they're pretty, and they're usually always women, almost if not always women, and um, and they're always shared like crazy. But I talked to one of those photographers, and he said, you know, it's really hard to know if I'm a good photographer because all you have to do is put a pretty picture of a ballerina, and people flip out. But he doesn't know if like if it's good enough to go to that next level and have a book or have an exhibition because they all kind of blend into the same thing. So my suggestion would be to not jump right into the same thing, but to find a different twist on that thing or to find something different altogether. There's one photographer, I've forgotten his name, getting a lot of play right now because he, um, what? Is it no, I, I know that name. No, it's not dance photography. He's somebody in S San Francisco or something. Anyway, he does wedding photography. So how do you separate yourself out from the pack with wedding photography. So what, what he does is he um, takes his couples and does a formal with them on the top of a cliff. <laughs> always the same cliff. And it's always scary. And it's gone majorly viral. How long he's going to be able to reproduce that because it's the same photo over and over again. But it's always exciting. Another guy I just read about, he's um, doing nudes. Um, but his thing is he does nudes uh, in all 50 states. And here's the thing that's really interesting about promoting yourself. A lot of it has to do with your process. It's almost as much as the photo itself. So the video I showed you about Dance After Dark, the process was, I think, as exciting to watch as seeing the photo. And if you see the photo removed from the process, you might not appreciate it as much. So his whole thing is he does a naked shot in an abandoned building in every state in the country. But it's that story. He took out his back seat, and he put a bed in there, and it's just this romantic idea of like you know going across the country. And that's what everyone talks about. So also, that's where video comes in really, really helpful, is videos tend to go more viral than than um, photographs, and it's because people like to see your process a bit. Uh, do you do you sell your photographs um, in limited edition prints after it's been published in a book? And if you do, what is that process? Are all of them for sale, and, and are they limited, or do you just let the book do it? Yeah, I do sell, and I have had um, I had I worked on Dancers Among Us for maybe three years, and all the only I, on, I never even saw the images this big. I only saw them on the computer screen or in a 9 by 12 book. And then I had an exhibition in Korea, and it was a contemporary art museum. It was three floors, 60 images. They printed them all. They flew me out to Korea, and I walked into the museum for the first time, and I saw these 60, 70, 80-inch prints, and I thought, wow, this is, how I, I, this is how it's meant to be seen because you can see the little details and everything, you know. So it's very exciting to see the prints, and that's what the YMCA is. I mean, I, I just had a big show at the Hudson River Museum, and the day that closed, they brought the prints to the to 92nd Street Y, and then in February, there'll be a show at Lincoln Center. And when you see them big, and I print them all on aluminum. Aluminum is a really great material. It's less expensive. It's easy to hang. They're very light, and they have a lot of pop. Black and white and color both look great on aluminum. And it's lim limited edition? Or yes, okay. for those, yeah usually about 15 for each size. There's, you, uh, everybody knows about limited edition, right? So once you've sold all 15, you can never sell it again. Ha has anybody seen the famous series called The Last Sitting or The Last Session? It's by Bert Stern of Marilyn Monroe, yeah. right? So I have one of those. It's the only big investment I've ever made. It's in my studio. And there's these beautiful, and then she died two days later, these beautiful prints of her semi-naked in you know, black and white. They're very popular. They've totally sold out. So I went to Art Basel last year. You know Art Basel? Okay, and I, he, his estate had a huge booth, but it didn't make any sense because they were all sold out. So why did they have a huge booth? Because they took the same exact prints that everybody's already bought, and they added in a color on the rose. So 
Now you could buy an edition of 25 with a yellow rose, red rose, or blue rose, which really devalues the, 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 the whole idea of it, retouching a, a shot from the 50s anyway. But um, so you can always find creative ways, or you do like, a, like 60 and a half inches now in a whole new edition. People will do that. You know. And another thing about photography right now, you know, everything is, is photo manipulated, basically. So if you go to one of these huge art shows like Art Basel and you just walk around and you see all the photography that's being presented, almost all of it is um, photo manipulation. And so I, I, I finally saw this huge print, say twice the size of this, of John Kennedy on his sailboat in a storm. And it blew my mind because I said to the gallery, I said, this is just magnificent. He said, isn't it though? I said, finally, I find a photograph that is absolutely real and stunning on its own. And he said, well, this is a composite. The guy had never photographed John Kennedy. Somehow he found a photograph of his sailboat and a photograph of Kennedy and he combined them together. So that's what happened. So I think it's also another thing. If you're going to go with photo manipulation, make that your thing. But if not, then try and really find the true form of photography because people really appreciate like real honest moments. Could you tell us what cross street the Y is on? Lexington and 92. Nine, Lex? The Y's on 92nd and Lex. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned towards the beginning how you started photographing dancers without ever done, doing it before. So you pretty much were letting them do all the work as far as poses and moves. Have you become more uh, acquainted or more familiar with the terminology of dancers so now you can direct them better? I can direct them, but I don't know what to call it. Got it. <laughs> like, I'll say, do a split jump, and you'll say, what? What is it? <laughs> like, I don't know. So I know what I want, and I knew what I wanted from the beginning. The thing was, since I was an athlete, I was approaching it more from that perspective. So the early shots are more about the athletics of dance. And then, and I would say, you're hailing a cab, and it looks like you're running or something, and then they would show me some things, and we could, we could. But like I said, I think it's really important. The dancers know their bodies. So a lot of times, we'll start with, what's your strength? Let's start with your strength. We'll tell a story around your strength. If I'm asking somebody to jump and they're more about flexibility, then they're not showing off their strength. And you always want to try and find that wow thing. One thing that helped me a lot, uh, before I'd ever shot a dance photo, um, I had a group email for all the Paul Taylor dancers, maybe 10 of them. And I wrote uh, to them, I said, thank you so much. We're going to do it next week. And listen, you know, I'm not sure yet what you should wear. And I'm torn between everyday clothing and leotards. And then I, within seconds, I got eight emails that said, I'm not wearing a leotard. <laughs> so how lucky was I? Because then that took, because the, if, if they're all wearing leotards, it, it's not at all the project. The idea is that they're everyday life. They're just like us. It's just that they're a dream version of us. And if they hadn't been so adamant about that. So that's the kind of thing, you know, you listen to the people that know best, and then you take that and you try and make it into something. I know that you find the image once you get to the location, but I guess my question is, what is your setup like in regards to gear and lighting? What are you bringing to the shoot? If it, until this the series of the After Dark, I'd never used any lighting. And I travel with, um, with this only, like anywhere I go, it's this. So in that is uh, two bodies. One is just a backup that I never use. And then uh, six lenses. And it's uh, the, the three zooms, all at 2.8, 28 to 70, 70 to 200, and 14 to 24. And then um, three fixed lenses, like a 50, 85, and 28, all at 1.4. And that's pretty much it. And then I just kind of look for light. I don't like to manipulate the light that much. Also, it's very cumbersome if you're bringing strobes around. and Because most everything I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get out of there quickly. I mean, even in the daytime, usually the most interesting locations are the ones you're not allowed to be in. You know, so what we'll always do is practice the pose somewhere else, right? And then, you know the quote, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Every time I ask somebody if I can do something, except maybe the exception of that cookie shot, but almost every time, the answer is no. Knee jerk, no. And I think that's a lot about life, isn't it? It's like you have this opportunity, you come up with an idea, and then your first inclination, is it yes or is it no? Are you half full or half empty? And if you say no, you'll never discover it. And if you say yes, you might discover something special. And I'm just shocked at how many times people say no for no reason other than it's easier to say no. So I've just stopped asking. Uh, hi. I like energetic power in your pictures. And I thought dancers uh, look 
comfortable and are having a fun. How did you do they dance comfortable in front of you? That's a great I, I question. Um, a couple of things, I think. First of all, I think dancers are really used to being told exactly what to do. And um, there's not a lot of collaboration if you're in a dance company. You know, the choreographer comes in, they say, you're going to do this, this is your move, do it again. No, you're wrong, do it again. And I try to bring them into the creative process. So the first thing is we work together. I start with a question. Okay, we're here. This is a cool location. What, we, what do you think you'd be doing here? And how can we tell that story? So they're right off the bat engaged with the process. And then secondly, I just absolutely love it. I, I, it's such an adrenaline high for me that I, I do think that they get caught up, as the one guy said, he's like, there's just an adrenaline thing that you get caught up in. And when you get a great shot together, I mean, everybody celebrates and it's a lot of fun. So the process is fun. And now at this point, people have come in expecting that. So they already are kind of loose and ready to do it because they've heard or know people that have done it and they know it's been fun. Um, early on, because my process, it's like, I go to Chicago, people would drive six hours or get on a flight halfway across the country. The girl that's on the wine bottle drove in from Sacramento. Then the next morning drove back to do a photo shoot. And then she shows up and says, what are we going to do? Wide-eyed and excited. I said, I don't know. I, and that can be dis, you know, a little disturbing. Like, well, I just committed my day or my time or my money to come do this. You don't even know what we're doing. And for a while, and you know, like even tonight, I don't know what we're going to do. And there's like seven dancers that are expecting answers, and I don't have them yet. And after a while, you get used to, I, early on, I would say, this is the process. Don't worry. We're going to find it. The picture's just around the corner. Sometimes you have to walk. To get to the meatpacking district uh, with the girls on point, we had, they all walked in their point shoes from Barnes & Noble to the meatpacking district as it was starting to rain. And I didn't know if we got there, if what we'd find, and it was freezing. But there's just, it's all part of an exciting process. And I think p people are pretty sh sure that I'm not going to stop until we get a cool shot. And so then they're reassured that they might have to spend some time, but in the end, it's gonna, they're going to be happy. Thank you. This is um, uh, very inspiring and infectious and uh, great. Thank and you. I wanted to ask you um, about being uh, true to photography and uh, not manipulating too much. You mentioned in the very beginning that you manipulate a little bit of the color and to what extent and uh, how? So what sort of photo manipulation do I do? And y yeah, my knowledge of Photoshop is pretty limited. So it, I, I like, I like to, sh to shoot it flat because then you have more latitude. You know, so you don't want to blow out your highlights. So when you look at the picture in the camera, it looks flat. And I want to, but I love pictures with a lot of contrast. But if you shoot with a lot of contrast, you're going to lose your highlights, your shadows. So it's about shooting it flat and then popping up the contrast and uh, bringing in more color, primarily. I do, unless it's tricky. If, it, if there's something like that ballerina shot, I had somebody fix that because uh, separating the foreground and the background was challenging. Um, so they didn't, get, they didn't get caught up in it. For pretty much I do everything, yeah. Oh, this is going to be very hard if you have a conversation with okay. I'm very sorry. Is there a possibility that uh, m I might have seen a, a shot here that um, the the front image, the the dancer, is very clear and the entire background is pretty blurry, mm -hmm. and that that wasn't consistent with the rest of them. So maybe is there a possibility that you chose to do that? Oh, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just the the, the lens setting. Yeah. So I wouldn't like shoot everything sharp and then blur it out later. That I want to see in the camera. Thank you for sharing. I uh, really appreciate it. I feel like I agree with the young man in the video that your energy is infectious and contagious. Um, going back to how you started the talk about the sort of cynicism that exists in photography, and we don't sort of trust images right away because we're so used to seeing composites. Um, I mean, your, your work is sort of a celebration of joy in the everyday moment, and the reaction must be all positive. But do you get anything negative with your big social media presence? Uh, yes, um, there is negativity, more so for the after dark stuff. Um, but even, you know, I mean, c people can be cruel to each other. A lot of times the negativity is to each other. Like, oh, she didn't point at her foot, you know, or wow, look at her knee is a little bent. Like, and these are kids, and, they, and the other kids are, like, so there's these commentary back and forth on the photos, which is really upsetting to me. Um, in terms of the photos, every once in a while, you know, you'll, you'll hear something. But for the most part, it's been pretty positive. One of the things with social media, you have to kind of make a choice, right? whether or not you put stuff out there and allow people to grab it. And I've had some really particularly bad experiences with 
photos going very viral, but nobody had any clue that I took them because I wasn't watermarking for a long time or just in a corner and it could be cropped out. And uh, this one time, I do have the distinction of crashing a porn site. Mm -hmm. And what happened was there was this, you know, uh, Dancers Among Us, this sh site that did softcore porn and other stuff. But you can imagine how much bandwidth they'd need for the softcore porn. They put up the entire gallery of Dancers Among Us, every single photo, without any credit whatsoever. And it went extremely viral. It's just like ballerinas in everyday situations, which is ridiculous because they weren't all ballerinas. But it went very viral, and I'm still feeling the impact of that today, where shots are going from all everywhere, but they don't know that they were. And there was a book out, you know, they, they didn't credit it. So that can happen a lot. But I think that if you're not putting it out there and not letting people see it, then you're never going to build the presence to begin with. It's a tough call. I don't even know if that was part of your question. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank, well, you, thank so you very much. much. This was fun.